Good morning, family. I give God thanks and praise for this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm so incredibly thankful to God and I'm thankful for you. I'm not going to belabor the point. We're just going to go ahead and dig in today. We're looking at another lectionary passage. It is um, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 33. I'm reading um, the new international version of the Bible and it reads as follows. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. And when he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place, when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. And the tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son. And he said to himself, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? The people responded, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus's parables and they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people hailed that he was a prophet. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's talk for a little while about keeping the tension. Let's keep the tension. Let's bow forward a prayer. God, as we center ourselves in this moment to receive from you, move anything that will hinder us from receiving what it is that you offer, exactly what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. So my daddy used to sing a song called Anchored in the Lord. And I can rarely hear it now without having a visible emotional response. My love for my daddy who died in 2012 is bound in memory to that song. It brings up in me this strange tension between the pain of my continued grief and the beautiful message he wished us to hear when he sang it. And if the storms don't cease, and if the winds keep on blowing in my life, my soul has been anchored in the Lord. And then I remember growing up and going to summer revival and having testimony services. And the one song I always remember says, there's a storm out on the ocean and it's moving this away. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, it will surely drift away. And when we think about an anchor of a boat, at least the images that I have from when I was growing up, it always included a rope tied both to the anchor and to the side of the boat. Now, the boat could move and drift as long as there was slack in the rope, but the boat stopped, was saved from drifting away once the rope was at its highest point of tension. The tension was necessary to stop the boat. We see this in pulleys, a safety rope attached to a mountain climber only stops to fall once the rope hits the point of tension between the anchor and the weight of the climber. The tension helps keep them from falling. 
So Jesus tells another parable. You will see if you go back to this um, chapter in Matthew, he's told a series of parables, but he's telling another. And this one is of a landowner who used his land to plant a vineyard, fenced it in, dug a wine press and built a watchtower. And afterward, the landowner leased this vineyard to tenants and traveled to a foreign land. And when the harvest came and payment for use of the vineyard was due, the landowner sends several servants to collect the landowner's designated portion of the harvest, payment for the lease. And the tenants beat one servant, kill another, and stone the third. And so the landowner sends more servants, seemingly like sheep for the slaughter, all are killed. And finally, the landowner still appearing unconvinced that the tenants are bold enough in their evil to kill his son. That his son would have enough status to place fear in the hearts of the tenants. But instead, he forfeits his son's life as well. The tenants killing the son in order to steal his inheritance. A strange, a strange y'all, an unreasonable notion since the landowner clearly owned much more than this one vineyard and the son's inheritance in full would have been beyond their reach. But there is absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, reasonable about wickedness and evil. So Jesus asked those listening, when the landowner finally comes, what do you think? he will do to those tenants. And the people listening, outraged at hearing the parable, they say he will put those miserable wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him pay, give him his due. And then Jesus says, have you never read in scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the chief stone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Jesus continues, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produce the fruit of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces and will crush anyone on whom it falls. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, the author reports that they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but fearing the crowds who saw Jesus as a prophet, they chose instead to just leave. Now, there are a few things that many Christians have historically believed about this parable and passage, which I don't deny, okay? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven Um, The ultimate reward belongs to those whose life and actions reflect the love, the justice, and the generosity of God. To those who bear the fruit of God. But further, Jesus is also known as that chief cornerstone. I mean, um, it's not something that most Christians or many Christians who spent any amount of time studying Christian faith would find um, to be a strange thing. Like we've always heard or understood God Um, Jesus to be this chief cornerstone that the builders had rejected. All of this I take no issue with, but there are parts of the of the parable and even of this broader passage that I do take issue with. Now, I need to give a precursor. It is important to name that parables, as we've mentioned before, are stories that Jesus often told to teach a lesson. And often the lesson was taught in a way that that was obscure and sometimes unclear. But parables are also metaphors um, or analogies. And metaphors or comparisons um, to teach lessons are never 100% aligned, okay? So what I'm saying is there is always a disparity between the analogy or this metaphor and the actual person, place, or thing it is used to describe. So nothing is 100% lined up, okay? I just need it to say that. And that's true also for parables. But with that said, I'm reading this passage and I want to know, particularly at this point in time, in our world, in our culture, in our nation, 
in the life of us as a people. I want to know, why would this landowner continue to send servants and then his son into a situation that was proven to be deadly? Why does Jesus not clearly call out those he is presumably speaking to? Those presumed to be causing harm. The people call the tenants miserable wretches, but Jesus does not. Jesus doesn't even clearly respond to their judgment, but goes on into another ambiguous disclosure about the rejected cornerstone. The author recording this account says that the chief priests and the Pharisees believe Jesus is talking about them, but Jesus never says, nor in any obvious way, implies that. There's only one clarity, one clarity that I can see. Maybe you see more. All I see as one clarity is that the kingdom of God will be given to those whose actions, whose work aligns with the call of God. So what then do we do with this parable, family? <laughs> what do we do at this particular point in our lives with this parable? Well, after about the 20th read, I realized that there was something about Jesus's approach that seemed different. You see, unlike many of Jesus's other parables, the empathy in this parable is for the more powerful. In other cases, it is usually empathy for the one with clear vulnerability, the one, um, the one only the one lost um, coin that's lonely or the widow versus the judge, right? There is this clear vulnerability, this clear delineation between, you know, the one that is separated or lost or the one who is up against someone very powerful. And so now I have another question now that we are seeing that Jesus is, is somewhat veering from what I would consider a norm. If the landowner represents God and the rejected cornerstone, Jesus, then why would Jesus desire to invoke empathy for God? Empathy and compassion even for himself. Jesus, who doesn't even defend himself against the false claims that lead to his death. Why invoke emotion in the listeners and lead them to defend a God who by nature needs no defense. Well, many of you may remember a movie entitled A Time to Kill based upon um, a John Grisham novel that came out in 1996. It starred Samuel L. Jackson and Matthew McConaughey. And Samuel L. Jackson plays a father of a young black girl brutally raped and beaten by two white men in Mississippi. And he kills these two men and is on trial for their murder. And in the closing arguments, Matthew McConaughey, who played Samuel L. Jackson's lawyer, asks the jurors to close their eyes as he recounts the gruesome beating and rape of this precious baby girl. And after he describes in detail the event, he asks them to imagine that this little girl is white. You see, the emotion of the juror's face literally changes in that moment. The faces shift and they find him not guilty. Now, I must admit, that was the one part of the movie I found to be the most unbelievable, right? It was the most unrealistic portion of the movie that they still found this black man not guilty of killing two white men in public in cold blood. But that's neither here nor there. It was based on the book. The point, though, is that in order for the jurors to have empathy for this beautiful, precious little black girl, they had to first have an image painted for them of someone they would naturally have empathy and compassion for. And it had me asking, do we lack empathy for God? Do we lack compassion for the God of compassion? I've never really thought about the need for compassion towards God, but let's just assume here that Jesus might be taking us in that direction. Let's just assume that Jesus might be taking us 
that way? And if so, what is Jesus invoking empathy and compassion for? In asking that question, I looked back and I saw two ways that Jesus might be invoking um, specific kinds of empathy for God in this passage. One is that God experiences injustice. Again, the God of justice experiences and feels injustice. Despite the lingering questions I have about the landowner's sending of the servants and then his son to their slaughter, whether this is where the literal interpretation of the metaphor must veer or not, if I extend the basic truth, the basic truth, you all, that regardless of whether or not I believe the landowner should continue or should have continued to send people, the reality remains that his sending people did not cause those who killed to kill. I recently watched the docu-series Surviving R. Kelly, and in one of the episodes during his first trial, fans had gathered outside of the courtroom defending a man they knew absolutely nothing about apart from the songs he sung on the radio. And then I heard one woman scream, well, where were these girls' parents? I cringed, not because it wasn't a valid question, but because it wasn't the most valid question. It was, in this sense, an inappropriate question. It immediately placed the blame of a man who repetitively committed acts of pedophilia and abuse on parents who, as evidenced by the series, often fought tooth and nail to get their daughters out of the clutches of a well-practiced abuser. One fan there to support and defend him met him outside of the courtroom and was contacted by him after he was acquitted. She is now a survivor, along with all the girls and women before her and after her, having met him at age 15. We are well acquainted with victim blaming and tactics that shift our focus from the real evil at work to the problem we've been socialized to attack. When a person is killed by authorized people in an unauthorized manner and the focus moves to the shady character of the victim that had absolutely nothing to do with their death, then we allow evil to run free, to truly, you all, run amok. The tenets of this parable killed, hard stop. If we extend that one belief to the landowner, not that we don't need to struggle with the landowner's perceived actions, not that we don't need to struggle with any gaps in the system, but if we can just extend this grace long enough to work through this, then what we might see is a God through this landowner whose son is killed unjustly by people who believe themselves above the law, people who believe they can steal whatever they want, whenever they want. They steal, they kill, and destroy the lives of so many families for their own power and greed. God's grief is not explicitly named, but is surely implied. God loses God's son to the evil of this world. But then the second way I see the possibility of Jesus invoking empathy and compassion in us is through Jesus being rejected by the builders. Rejected means to dismiss as inadequate or inappropriate, failing to meet the standards. When human beings are called illegal or aliens, that equates to being um, rejected in a way that says you are inadequate as a human, inappropriate and failing to meet a standard simply because of where you were born. The language they speak or the hue of, you, of your skin or the poverty you have endured. 
It allows evil to distort the true image of humanity and make space for the justification of mass hysterectomy, sexual assault, and the atrocity and traumas of separating and caging families. Consider what Jesus is implying. He said, I have been rejected, treated as inadequate, not enough, inappropriate, and failing to meet a standard by those I was present for the creation of. Jesus was saying, I know how it feels to be treated like I don't matter. Jesus in this moment was shocking. The all-powerful God experiences and feels injustice, experiences and feels the devaluation of God's self. The all-powerful of God aligns with the pain of those rejected, the pain of those being killed unjustly, unjustly assaulted, abused, robbed, and denied access to the reasonable, just a reasonable quality of life. And it hit me hard. Jesus was revealing in this passage the vulnerability of God. The all-powerful God is vulnerable. It hit me. To love is to be vulnerable. To love is to open yourself to hurt. And y'all, God doesn't just love. God is love. God doesn't fall in and out of love. God is love. So God always loves. God's very being and essence is subjected to hurt and pain by virtue of loving not just some of us, but all of us. Jesus being rejected, equated to love being deemed inadequate. Love being called inappropriate, love being named as not up to standard. But why? Why is it so important for us to get this? What purpose does empathy and compassion for God serve in our lives, in particular in the times we are living in? The cornerstone is considered the most essential part of a foundation of a building. It is the part of the building that prevents the disaster of collapse. It is the anchor. And now we've returned to where we began. We may know and profess Jesus to be our anchor, but when life happens, when storms come, when justice is delayed, when our babies die, when our bills go unpaid, when depression overwhelms, our bodies break down, our most basic needs go unmet, when we can't get past why the landowner would continue to send innocent people seemingly to their death, then our life, our experiences, our rope, that connects us to our anchor gets real slack and we begin to fall. We begin to drift. But what if, what if all the horrible things we are struggling and wrestling with in our life's rope and our life's experiences that tether us together? What if all of those things we are struggling with is held in tension with all the ways we also see the love of God. Held in tension with all the answered prayers. In tension with the moments of healing and relief. Held in tension with the food that miraculously showed up. Held in tension with the times that peace came unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. Held in tension with the reality that in order for our God to love and to love and be loved, then our God must also experience pain. Held in tension with the vulnerability of our God. Don't Stop wrestling with the hard parts, theodicy, this, um, this understanding of why bad things happened. But what if Jesus is inviting us in this moment to make sure we hold that struggle alongside the love of God? 
and to let that tension between the two keep us from drifting, from falling, to keep us tethered tightly to our anchor. Now, I can't say that I necessarily believe God needs our empathy and compassion. But what if a sense of compassion and empathy for, for the all-powerful God's vulnerability is not only a reflection of the way we are created in the image of God, but is also used to keep us secure to the anchor of our faith, which is in Christ Jesus, the cornerstone. I don't profess to know why many of the things in this world happen the way that they do. But there is near the end of this passage, a powerfully, a powerfully lingering hope for us. In the movie, A Knight's Tale, the main character is arrested and placed before a crowd for judgment. And just as you think is going to go all wrong, a figure from the crowd wearing a, a cape with a hood appears and pardons him. And when he removes his hood, he declares his title as the crown prince. And he says that his word is beyond contestation. That's how he said it. My word is beyond contestation. Beyond the fact that in spite how things appear in both the parable and with the rejected stone, the landowner still holds the power to come and take what is his and enact justice. And the stone does in fact become revealed as the chief cornerstone. I hear in Jesus's discourse, the message that those who believe they are justified in defiling and warping the work of God have not escaped despite how it appears. I hear the hope that time is not up yet, but there's another promise of hope. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven will be given to those who produce the fruit of the kingdom. That may seem obvious, but many people these days seem to be real confused about what is the work of God. But thankfully for us, this passage is preceded by Jesus's famous sermon on the Mount in chapter five. The first and the last beatitude in that sermon both clarify, clarify for us, clarify for us who will inherit the kingdom of God. First, is the poor in spirit, the destitute of spirit. Now, spirit can mean any number of things that don't necessarily align with Jesus's sermon, but one meaning of spirit is breath. Hear me, those destitute of the breath of their nostrils and mouth, those who can't breathe, those poor or destitute of the vital principle or the efficient source of power will, not might, not maybe, but will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And then the last beatitude says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those doing everything in their power to get life right, but keep getting kicked down by the bulldozer of racism, crushed by the crane of misogyny, beaten by the battering ram of homophobia and transphobia. Blessed are those just trying to live their life, but keep getting stabbed by the knife of poverty and burned by the furnace of mass incarceration, smothered by the bigotry of defining difference as the Deficient. Blessed are those who can't sleep at night because they're worrying about when their babies are going to eat, who are harassed and abused, who are being choked and strangled by families simply for telling the truth. Blessed are those who are deficient of breath and who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for yours is the kingdom 
of heaven. And R. Kelly's wife, Andrea Kelly, finally decided to leave in the middle of the night. She said that she had decided that she would rather die trying to get free than die in that house that had become her prison because she didn't have the courage to run. And I heard speaking through her, the melodic voices of her ancestors who sing, and before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. I don't believe God desires our martyrdom. But I do believe that God models and honors the truth that martyrdom for the sake of life will always grant life beyond life. That which is in the honest pursuit of being life given and life giving is kingdom fruit. This is our promise. This is our hope. And we hold it along with the vulnerable love of God as we press through trial after trial, storm after storm, so that in struggle, we don't fall or drift away because the tension of our life's rope is holding our soul to our anchor. And this is who we are. We are the body of Christ. We are the representation of the God who was falsely accused, who gave his life, who loved. And on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus gathered all the disciples together. And Jesus um, as he blessed the bread and, and he broke it and he served them, he says, this is my body and this is my blood. He says, and I want you to eat. I want you to eat together and I want you to eat of my body and drink of my blood as often as you can in remembrance of me. He says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And this is quite profound, y'all. This is, this is the prophetic Jesus speaking. What we now know through psychology is that pain can hinder our memory. Jesus was calling them time and time again to come back to the table, to come back to this moment, to come back to the memory of the love that was given for them when they are up against the world and fighting on every side. Jesus says, keep coming back to the table to remember and hold in tension the love that I had for you that was so great that I suffered. And I want you to remember when this is all said and done that I also resurrected. And so we come to the table today, whether it's your kitchen table, whether it's your side table in your room, whether it's your lap, whether it's your coffee table, that table today is God's table. And we bring the elements that we have. We bring whatever it is that we have for God is not insufficient. God is not lacking. And so God's power is not lacking, just like God's love is not power. So whatever you have, a cracker, a piece of bread, some water, some juice, some Gatorade, whatever it is, bring it. That becomes the body and the blood of Christ because the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is right where you are. And so here in this moment, I want us to take a moment to pause. And I want us to give our whole self to God. I want you to give those things to God in this moment that have just been too much. Give the things that are threatening to overtake you. Give the emotions that have exhausted you, but give the good and the bad and the ugly. Give it all to God right now. Close your eyes and just take a moment. Give it to God in words. Give it to God in images. Give it to God in emotions. Just give it 
to God. Let God hold you for just a moment as you come to this table and as you remember to hold in tension all the things that you are experiencing with the love of a God who will never leave you nor forsake you. God, take all of who we are in this moment, all of what we hope to be and wish we were. Take us all and grant to us through this, your body and blood, exactly what we need by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered the disciples and he took the bread and he broke it, he blessed it, and he gave it to them. And he says, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Then he took the cup and he did the same. He blessed it and he passed it around. And he said, this is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Take it and drink it. And so together, I invite you to take and eat the body. Now drink the blood given for you and love and salvation. It says that they sung a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. So this is the moment where you type in the chat words of love or you send a text you make a quick phone call. But then after you do that, and after this service has ended, I want you to sing a song that brings your soul joy. And I want you to dance before the Lord. Because that tension is what's going to save us. I love you. And may the peace of God forever be with you.